All right, guys, so <clears throat> we've concluded our section on epistemology, right? whole lot there. Now, I've thought about this a long time. How do I want to do this with you guys in regard to the God section, right? Because this is a an intro to philosophy class, and it's not just an intro to philosophy class, but it's, a, it's an intro to philosophy class um, that is going to be different than some other some other classes in the sense that we're going to go through this. This is what I've decided to do. Since I'm also teaching philosophy of religion, right, and I'm also teaching uh, a couple of courses that are related to this, and because you're most likely getting some of these other courses, I'm going to leave out um, of this particular lecture series on uh, God's existence for and against, I'm going to leave out the very specific arguments. Um, now, this is very important. If you want those, if you want those, let me know. I can send you uh, the lectures. You, you either you, you got them already on the podcasts. You can listen to those if you want, or I can even send them uh, the video lectures to you. But what we're going to do in this is, again, because this is an intro to philosophy class, I'm going to let those other, the specifics of the arguments, uh, be addressed by the other courses that you're already most likely taking here. Now, so what we're going to do is I do want to address um, – a couple key issues. I want to address the arguments in general, like what are those arguments in general for the existence of God, and what are the arguments in general for the non-existence of God, um, and then, uh, so kind of do a, a grand overview of that, so you look from a thousand foot overview, you kind of get a, a general picture of the of the, of the the genre there, um, and then with some remarks on each maybe of those arguments. But I also want to go ahead and address the apathy question. This is the issue of apathy. Does God exist in the sense that, or let me say it this way, not only does, does God exist, but is the question valid? Is, is it something that you should even be thinking about? Is, is that a question that you should take seriously? So with that said, you're going to see probably a lot of the specifics on your slides um, as you go through this later, if you have your, you know, your own personal copy. But for our lecture purposes here, we're going to go through this apathy question, really important. Um, and then we're going to go through the overview of the arguments for God's existence and the overview of God's uh, arguments against that uh, position. Um, and again, trusting that you'll get the rest of those uh, uh, here in the courses you're most likely taking. Again, if you want those, the specifics, just let me know and I, I can make that happen for you. So without any further ado, oh, and let me go ahead and say this too. Um, as we start this, this, this particular topic, right, um, we're going to listen to a lecture. If we were on campus, there's a lecture playing of, of uh, Dr. William Lane Craig going through an argument against apathy. Um, you can listen to that on here. You'll hear it here. But if you uh, if you want, you know, of course, you won't be able to see the slides or whatever. But if you want, you can go to YouTube and you, you can look up that lecture and just watch where he's actually giving it. Uh, you probably type in William Lane Craig, uh, Northwestern University, because that's where it takes place. William Lane Craig, Northwestern University. Um, Veritas Forum. Uh, that's the uh, the channel that puts it out. The Ver Veritas Forum, um, and then William Lane Craig, Northwestern University. You can listen to that if you want. So, without any further ado, here we go. As if as if we weren't already in deep water. Now, our, what we're about to start today is what does God exist, right? But before we start that, there's been as of late, there's been like a kind of a stance of what, what people would call apathy towards the question. So they would say something like, well, first, what do you think I mean by that? Right, right. What do you think, Hannah? Uh, I, was <laughs> I was talking about what? Homeboy. Homeboy? Who's yeah, homeboy? I, was, uh, I said that entirely. Yeah. Yeah. So what do I mean by apathy in regards to the God question? What do you think I mean? What do you think? Mad Madison, uh, forget what your last name is. I remember yours because it's French. What do you think, Mad Madison Sinere? No empathy? As like you don't feel sorry for people or, or, or relate to people. <laughs> so 
What is apathy? Maybe we should start there. Let's clarify our terms. What is apathy? All right. Everybody get that? Apathy is, is, is a lackadaisical type attitude towards whatever the position is. So you just don't care, right? So right now, who, who cares whether or not uh, a cricket is brown or green? You're just kind of apathetic towards that, right? It doesn't matter to you. You're not really worried about it. Does that make sense? So that's supposedly a stance towards the God question. You know, a lot of people, does God exist? Well, well it doesn't really matter to me or not. You know, who cares? What do you think might be right or wrong with that? What might be right or wrong about that? Right, correct. Are there any pros to that position holding that, or are there any cons to that? All right, so let's go to the pro. What did you say the pro might be? All right, so here's the question Does it affect you? If God exists, does that affect you? Now, again, I'll just go ahead and remark. Remember, you're not hearing a lot of the student response here, but that's not really germane to what's going on, so it's not a big deal. Um, it, you can even think in your head, as I ask the questions, if you can't hear the students, think how you might respond to those questions if, if you were just, if I was asking you. Because I am, really. Let's just be specific. Let's say that, for the sake of argument, let's say that God exists, the Christian, the Judeo-Christian God, and let's say that if you reject that Judeo-Christian God, then you go to hell for eternity. Does that matter to you? Would that matter? Even if you, act on Earth, this side of, let's say, eternity, that you lived as if it didn't matter, would it matter to you all of a sudden in a couple of years? I'd say it'd be pretty dang important, right? Now, let's say that there was no God, and you lived as if there were one. Would it matter to you and say, 20 years or whatever, 30 years, 100 years. Well, in one sense, no, because you wouldn't be there for it to matter about, right? It wouldn't matter in any sense at all, right? So in a way, that's almost like Pascal's wager, right? What is Pascal's wager? Pascal is French, man. Come on, he's over here with Signore, you know, had a hotel together in 1675 France. Uh, yes, Pascal. Pascal's wager is where it's kind of like a punnet square choices, where it's like if you choose to believe and you're right, then you win. If you choose not to believe and you're wrong, then you lose. If you choose to believe but it's not true, then you never had anything to lose to start with. Then. Right, and then if you and if you lose, then you've lost what? The point is Everything in the strongest possible sense of the word, right? So, so your best bet, according to your past, to go with Right. So what we're going to do today is we're talking about this because, one, we want to rattle the cage of the question because when we talk about the question of God's existence, some will treat it as just a mere exercise in academics, Right as if it's just another topic within philosophy. But again, more ramifications and more consequences come as a result of the way someone would answer that question than arguably any other question, right? So what we want to do at the very least is, is rattle the cage, so to speak, so that no one is apathetic about that question. Does that make sense? So Pascal's wager, there are problems with that big problems with that if you're offering that as an argument for God's existence, right? So, in fact, even during my undergrad, I had to write a paper as to the problems with Pascal's wager as an argument for God's existence, right? Um, but I think Pascal's wager is legitimate if, if it's used 
which a lot of people would argue, a lot of philosophers of religion would argue that the original intent was just to what? Just to get you to think about the question, right? Because again, offered as, a, as an argument, you know, I think your book goes through that here. And we'll get into that more later, some of the book stuff. But today, what we're really concentrating on the most part is does it matter, you know, if, if, if we even talk about the question, you know, as to whether or not God exists, you know, what, what, what does that entail? What does it mean if God exists? What does it mean if God doesn't exist? Now, of course, we could devote the entire rest of the course and the rest of the semester to, um, you know, talking about different theisms and, and different types of deism, such as pantheism, polytheism, deism, theism, all these sorts of things. But for sake of simplicity, uh, we'll just concern ourselves for the most part with, with deism and or theism, right? Does that make sense? Because those are the those make the biggest claims, at least in regards to. Uh, personally speaking, right? Because well, we don't need to get into all that part right now because that would be, again, more appropriate if we had a lot more time to talk about the different, uh, about the nuances between all of those competing systems. So what we'll do for the most part is, is concentrate on uh, deism, theism, those kind of things. Basically, the, the religious claims of, say, like Judaism, uh, Islam, and, and you know, Christian faith, right? Something like that. Um, before we go into that, what are just some of your thoughts? What are just some of your thoughts? Where I'll pull up this video here. Yeah. Yeah, I know you'll have an opinion about that. <laughs> do 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 do. I'm loving it. I'm loving it. Not yet. History, I pulled this up last night, so I didn't know where it was. Here it is. Look at all these. So it's an audio slave again. Yeah. Make sure this volume ain't gonna blast this out of Kingdom Come. I don't even have the audio plugged up. That would be bad. So what we're going to do, since everybody's so quick to offer their opinions here, which they weren't. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Death. <laughs> Death. Um, what we're going to talk about is I'm going to introduce you to this guy because. Uh, this is almost a revamped or more nuanced argument such as Pascal would offer, right? Something similar to that. And so what this guy does is he has a pretty effective method in the sense of at least getting you to think about the question. Um, so this guy, he, he just, he's, he's on the list of, because what we're going to do is I want to get, we're going to look at, some of the strongest points by the strongest sides, right? Like the last, one of the things I hate to see people do when they talk about this question is they'll get on YouTube or get on whatever else and they'll just look at Joe Blow versus Joe Blow, right? Does that make sense? You'll just see Dan versus Gil, you know, atheist Dan versus theist Gil. Well, so what we want to do is we want to see some of the strongest advocates for each position. Why, why, why might we want to do that? Right, you want to hear something at least that's going to be 
semi-accurate as to what people in the field are going to offer as arguments, right? Like that's kind of one of the frustrating things about this book, and we'll go into this when we go into the arguments proper, is that some of these arguments, like, my gosh, man, who on earth would offer some of these, right? Well, I mean, if you ever see Bill Nye versus uh, Ken Ham from the Yes. Yeah, see, Ken Ham is one of the ones that's really prominent, but he offers. Well, right, and he does, but that's what's sad is in philosophical circles. First, neither one, well, first, neither one of those guys even studies philosophy. So if you're just like, Ken, the Ken Ham guy subscribes to a system of thought called presuppositionalism, which, you know, as someone that studies philosophy, I'm not saying I don't. Aristotle or anything like that, but presuppositionalism is an absolute, it's, it's a joke. I mean, it's gosh awful. I mean, it is, is unbelievably bad, unbelievably bad. As an I can't stand to hear somebody open their mouth and start talking about presuppositionalism or arguing from that way, which is what you see here. Basically, the thing that I told you guys the other day is a terrible argument, you know, about the circular reasoning. God is, the Bible is the word of God because it says it's the word of God. I mean, that's just terrible. That's just just bad, bad argument. On the other hand, the other guy is just again kind of offering the kinds of things that you hear on you know internet memes or on Facebook or you know Twitter or whatever that are e just as easily answer answerable as the bad you know Christian argument guy. So you, I just stay away from that kind of stuff. You want to see right? You just want to see. Well, it may be, but it may be for the wrong reasons. You want to see people that are knowledgeable in the field that are going after what the real arguments are. So having said that, anyway, this guy, his, he's going to invite this, his name is William Lane Craig, and he's made something of a, of a big splash over the past two or three decades in philosophy. In fact, he's just, they just came out with a list with the most uh, 50 most influential philosophers. Uh, alive and he's in the top 12 of the 50 most influential living philosophers um because of his work and the philosophy of religion and the impact that that's had over the past you know two or three decades so just a little bit of background before i let you see this see this thing right here just so you can have a, a feel uh, for where he's coming from he's got a he graduated with the ba and something with highest honors he's got literally two master's degrees, he got a master's in philosophy of religion, he's got a master's in uh, history, church history. He's got a PhD in philosophy from the University of Birmingham, England. He's got a, another doctorate in theology from University of Munchen in Germany. So he's got two master's degrees, he's got two doctorates. Like this guy's just a walking, yeah, I mean, he's just an academic power. Well, not just a walking theologian, he's a, just an academic powerhouse, right? Now, as you guys will see, I mean, you know, some of the philosophical, you know, assumptions I don't agree with because I come from a classical school, right? Classical school of thought. He comes from a more modern school of thought. But anyway, it's just, I can't deny what his credentials are. I mean, he just, you know, he's just, that's just almost un unheard of to have two, you know, four postgraduate degrees, you know, anyway, so, and then like, yeah, even, even on top of that, two doctorates. Okay. So he's got, uh, I can't even count him here. He's got 20 something, you know, honors and lectureships. He's a member of a dozen plus professional societies. Uh, he's had over, can't even count here how many debates he's had, you know, on these particular topics. So anyway, this guy, he's not just some, he's not what we're talking about earlier, the Joe Blow, right? He's somebody that really has to be contended with, somebody that has to be wrestled with. Um, even if it's somebody like me that doesn't necessarily agree with all of his philosophical assumptions, because I come from a classical school of thought, um, you can't dismiss somebody like that. You have to deal with them. So again, this is something of a Pascal's wager consideration. And I think he even says that this is not an argument per se. It's just what? Something to what? Try to get you to what? Right, to think about the question. So I may leave it small right here just because this was done late 90s, early 2000s before uh, the video quality was 
screen. All right. Well, before the video quality was better. Like, I mean, his head looks like one pixel. So mm -hmm. if I blow it up, it may just make it that much worse. I may leave it small, but we'll see. Excuse me. And again, guys, this is where if you want to, you can go actually look at that actual video on YouTube if you want to, or you can stay here and just listen to the, uh, listen to the lecture audio and see your PowerPoints up to you. And that crazy noise was, I was adjusting the volume <laughs> on the thing in case you were like, what's that? <laughs> Man, Greg Sloan Isley is the cosmic orphan. He's the only creature in the universe who asks why. Other animals have instincts to guide them, but man has learned to ask questions. Who am I? He asks. Why am I here? Where am I going? Well, ever since the Enlightenment, when modern man threw off the shackles of religion, he's trying to answer those questions without reference to God. But the answers that came back were not exhilarating, but dark and terrible. Real quick, I'm going to pause that real quick. Uh, I would seriously advise that you take notes because this will probably be the more notes you take on this one, it'll be better discussion, but then two, it'll just make your reflection paper that much easier, right? You are the accidental byproduct of nature, a result of matter plus time plus chance. The enlightenment, when modern man threw off the shackles of religion, he's trying to answer those questions without reference to God. But the answers that came back were not exhilarating, but dark and terrible. You are the accidental byproduct of nature, a result of matter plus time plus chance. There is no reason for your existence. All you face is death. Modern man thought that in throwing off God, he had freed himself from all that stifled and repressed him. Instead, he discovered that in killing God, he had only succeeded in orphaning himself. For if there is no God, then man's life becomes ultimately absurd. It is without ultimate meaning, without ultimate value, without ultimate purpose. I'd like to look at each one of these tonight. First, life is without ultimate meaning. If each individual person passes out of existence when he dies, then what ultimate meaning can be given to his life? Does it really matter whether he ever existed or not? Now, it might be said that his life was important because it influenced others or affected the course of history. But that shows only a relative significance to his life, not an ultimate significance. If all of the events are ultimately meaningless, then what significance is there in influencing any of them? Mankind is destined only to perish in the eventual heat death of the universe. And thus the contributions of the scientists to the advance of human knowledge, the efforts of the doctor to alleviate pain and suffering, the efforts of the diplomat to secure peace in the world, the sacrifices of good people everywhere to better the lot of the human race. In the end, all of these come to nothing. They don't make one bit of difference, not one bit. And therefore each person's life is without ultimate significance. And because our lives are ultimately meaningless, the activities that we fill our lives with are also, in the final analysis, meaningless. The long hours spent in study at the university, our friendships, our interests, our jobs, our relationships, all of these are, in the final analysis, ultimately meaningless. This is the horror of modern man. Because he ends in nothing, he ultimately is nothing. 20th century man came to understand this. Read, for example, a play like Waiting for Godot by Samuel Beckett. During this entire play, two men carry on trivial, mind-numbing conversation while waiting for a third man to arrive who never does. And our lives are like that, Beckett is saying. We just kill time waiting for what we don't know. 
In a tragic portrayal of man, Beckett wrote another play in which the curtain opened, revealing a stage littered with trash. And for 30 long seconds, the audience sat and stared in silence at that junk. And then the curtain closed. That was all. The French existentialists, Jean-Paul Sartre and Albert Camus also understood this. Sartre portrayed life in his play, No Exit, as hell. The final line of the play are the words of resignation, well, let's get on with it. Hence, Sartre writes elsewhere of the nausea of existence. Man, he says, is adrift in a boat without a rudder on an endless sea. Camus also saw life as absurd. Life, he said, is like a man doomed for all eternity to roll a boulder up a hill only to have it continually roll back down again, over and over and over again. At the end of his brief novel, The Stranger, Camus' hero discovers in a flash of insight that life has no meaning and that there is no God to give it one. The French biochemist Jacques Monod seemed to echo these sentiments when he wrote in his work, Chance and Necessity. Man finally knows that he is alone in the indifferent immensity of the universe. Thus, if there is no God, then life itself becomes ultimately meaningless. Man and the universe are without ultimate significance. Second, life is without ultimate value. If life ends at the grave, then it ultimately makes no difference whether you've lived as a Stalin or as a saint. As the Russian writer Fyodor Dostoevsky put it, if there is no immortality, then all things are permitted. On this basis, a writer like Ayn Rand is absolutely correct to praise the virtues of selfishness. Live totally for self. No one holds you accountable. Indeed, it would be foolish to do anything else. For life is too short to jeopardize it by acting out of anything but pure self-interest. Sacrifice for another person would be stupid. But the problem becomes even worse. For regardless of immortality, if there is no God, then there is no absolute standard of right and wrong. All we're confronted with is, in Jean-Paul Sartre's words, the bare, valueless fact of existence. Moral values are either just the socio-cultural byproducts of the evolutionary process, or else a mere expressions of personal taste. In a world without God, who's to say whose values are right and whose are wrong? Who's to judge that the values of an Adolf Hitler are inferior to those of a Mother Teresa? The concept of objective morality loses all meaning in a universe without God. There can be no right and wrong, but that means that it's impossible to condemn war, oppression, brutality, or crime as evil. By the same token, one cannot praise brotherhood, equality, love, or self-sacrifice as good. For in, in a universe without God, good and evil do not exist. There is just a bare, valueless fact of existence, and there's no one to say that you are right and I am wrong. And thirdly, life is ultimately without purpose. If death stands with open arms at the end of life's trail, then to what end has life been? Is it all for nothing? Is there no reason for life? Is there no purpose at all for the human race? Or will it simply peter out someday, lost somewhere in the oblivion of an indifferent universe? The English writer H.G. Wells foresaw such a prospect. In his novel, The Time Machine, Wells' time traveler journeys far into the distant future to discover the eventual destiny of man. And all he finds is a dead earth, except for a few lichens and moss, orbiting a gigantic red sun. The only sounds are the rush of the wind and the gentle ripple of the sea. Beyond these lifeless sounds, writes Wells, the world was silent. Silent? It would be hard to convey the stillness of it. All the sounds of man, the bleeding of sheep, 
the cries of birds, the hum of insects, the stir that makes the background of our lives. All that was over. And so Wells time traveler returned. But to what? To merely an earlier point on the same purposeless rush towards oblivion. When as a non-Christian I first read Wells' book, I thought, no, no, can't end this way. But this is reality in a universe without God. If there is no God, then it will end that way, like it or not. There is no hope. There is no purpose. I'm reminded of T.S. Eliot's haunting lines, this is the way the world ends. This is the way the world ends. This is the way the world ends. Not with a bang, but a whipper. If there is no God, then our lives are not qualitatively different from that of a dog. I know that sounds harsh, but it's true. As the ancient writer of the book of Ecclesiastes put it, the fate of the sons of men and the fate of beasts is the same. As one dies, so dies the other. They all have the same breath, and man has no advantage over the beasts, for all is vanity. All go to one place, all are from the dust, and all turn to dust again. It reads more like a piece of modern existentialist literature than a book from the Bible. The author shows the futility of pleasure, wealth, education, political fame, and honor in a life doomed to end in death. His verdict? Vanity of vanities. All is vanity. If life ends at the grave, then we have no ultimate purpose for living. So I hope you begin to grasp the gravity of the alternatives before us. For if God does not exist, then all we are left with is despair. Life would have no significance, no value, no purpose. And that is why the question of the existence of God is so vital to mankind. Unfortunately, most people do not seem to realize this fact. And therefore, they go blindly on their way as though nothing had changed. I'm reminded of the story told by Friedrich Nietzsche, the great atheist of the 19th century, who proclaimed the death of God. Nietzsche tells the story of a madman who in the early morning hours burst into the marketplace, lantern in hand, crying, I seek God! I seek God! And since many of those standing about didn't believe in God, he provoked much laughter. Maybe God has gone on a voyage or emigrated, they laughed. And so they taunted him and mocked him. And then, writes Nietzsche, the madman turned in their midst and pierced them with his eyes. Whither is God? He cried, I shall tell you. We have killed him, you and I. All of us are his murderers. But how have we done this? How were we able to drink up the sea? Who gave us the sponge to wipe away the entire horizon? What did we do when we unchained this earth from its sun? Whither is it moving now, away from all suns? Are we not plunging continually? Backward, sideward, forward, in all directions. Is there any up or left? Are we not straying through an infinite nothing? Do we not feel the breath of empty space has not become colder? Is not night and more night coming on all the while? Must not lanterns be lit in the morning? Do we not hear anything yet of the noise of the grave diggers who are burying God? God is dead, and we have killed him. How shall we, the murderers of all murderers, comfort ourselves? The crowd stared at the madman in silence and astonishment. And at last, he smashed his lantern to the ground. I have come too early, he said. This tremendous event is still on its way. It has not yet reached the years of men. They did not truly comprehend what they had done in killing God. But Nietzsche predicted that someday people would realize the consequences of atheism. And this realization would usher in an age of nihilism. That is to say, the destruction of all meaning and value in life. The end of Christianity, wrote Nietzsche, means the advent of nihilism. This most gruesome of guests is standing already at the door. 
Our whole European culture is moving for some time now, wrote Nietzsche, with a tortured tension that is growing from decade to decade as toward a catastrophe, restlessly, violently, headlong, like a river that wants to reach its end, that, is, that no longer reflects, that is afraid to reflect. Most people still do not reflect upon the consequences of secular atheism. And therefore, like the crowd in the marketplace, go unknowingly on their way. But when we realize, as Nietzsche did, the consequences of what atheism implies, and when we stare atheism unflinchingly in the face, as Nietzsche had the courage to do, then his question presses hard upon us. How shall we, the murderers of all murderers, comfort ourselves? Well, it seems to me that confronted with this predicament, we have basically three alternatives. Number one, commit suicide. <laughs> Faced with the absurdity of life, one should simply end it now. Camus considered suicide to be the only serious philosophical question. Is it worth it to go on living? And sometimes we hear of people who answer no. In the United States, the leading cause of death among teenagers today is suicide. But for most of us, suicide is not the answer. The pleasures that life does afford and the fear of the unknown compel us to go on living. The second alternative is to face the absurdity of life and to live bravely. Atheist philosopher Bertrand Russell said, for example, that only upon the firm foundation of unyielding despair can the soul's habitation be henceforth safely built. Camus said that we should simply recognize the absurdity of life and then live in love for one another. But the problem with this alternative is that it is impossible to live consistently and happily within the framework of such a worldview. Man cannot live as though life had no meaning, value, and purpose. And so what people subconsciously do is to assume that their lives have meaning, purpose, even though they have no right to since modern man does not believe in God. And what I'd like to do is to look again at each of those three areas in which we saw that life is absurd without God, and to show how modern man fails to live consistently and happily within this worldview. First, the area of meaning. We saw that without God, life is ultimately meaningless. And yet philosophers continue to live as though life does have meaning. For example, Jean-Paul Sartre, argued that one may create meaning for his life by freely choosing some course of action. Sartre himself chose Marxism. Now, this program is utterly inconsistent. It is inconsistent to say on the one hand that life is absurd, and then to say on the other hand that one may create meaning for his life. For if life is objectively absurd, then man is trapped. Without God, there can be no objective meaning of life. Sartre's program is actually an exercise in self-delusion. The universe doesn't really acquire a meaning just because I happen to give it one. And I think this is obvious. For suppose you give the universe one meaning and I give it another. Who's right? Well, I think the obvious answer is neither one. For the universe in and of itself remains intrinsically meaningless, regardless of how we happen to regard it. Sartre is really saying, let's pretend that the universe has meaning. And this is just fooling yourself. The point is this, if God does not exist, then life is objectively meaningless. Mankind cannot live consistently and happily as though life were meaningless. And so in order to be happy, he invents certain purposes and projects for life. And he pretends that these invest his life with me. But this is, of course, entirely inconsistent. For without God, man and the universe are ultimately without significance. Turn next to the problem of value. 
This is where the most blatant inconsistencies occur. First of all, atheistic humanists are totally inconsistent in holding to the values of human love and brotherhood. Camus has been rightly criticized for inconsistently holding to the absurdity of life on the one hand and to the ethics of human love and brotherhood on the other. The two are logically incompatible. As one philosopher has written, it is impossible to generate an ethic of brotherly love out of a philosophy of nihilism. Bertrand Russell, too, was inconsistent. For although he was an atheist, Russell was also an outspoken social critic, denouncing war and restrictions on sexual freedom. Russell admitted that he could not live as though moral values were simply the subjective expressions of personal taste and that he therefore found his own views, and I quote, incredible. I do not know the solution, he confessed. The point is that if there is no God, then absolute right and wrong do not exist. As Dostoevsky said, all things are permitted. But Dostoevsky also showed that man cannot live this way. He shows this, for example, in his novel Crime and Punishment in which a young atheist brutally murders an old woman, though he knows that on his presuppositions he should not feel guilty. Nevertheless, he is consumed with guilt until he finally confesses his crime and gives his life to God. In his masterpiece, The Brothers Karamazov, Dostoevsky tells of how a man murders his father because his brother, Ivan, had told him that God does not exist. And therefore, there are no moral absolutes. The man tells Ivan that it was really Ivan himself who murdered their father, since it was Ivan who said the moral absolutes are illusory. Unable to live with the logical consequences of his own system, Ivan suffers a mental collapse. Man cannot live as though moral values do not exist. He cannot live as though it's perfectly all right for soldiers to slaughter innocent children. He cannot live as though it's all right for dictatorial regimes to follow systematic programs of physical torture of political prisoners. He cannot live as though it's perfectly all right for dictators like Pol Pot or Slobodan Milosevic to ruthlessly commit ethnic cleansing and genocide against their own people. Everything in him cries out to say that these acts are wrong, really wrong. But if God does not exist, he cannot. And therefore, he makes a leap of faith and affirms values anyway. And when he does so, he reveals the inadequacy of a world without God. The horror of an atheistic universe was brought home to me powerfully a few years ago. The television documentary called The Gathering. It featured interviews with survivors of the Holocaust who had regathered in Jerusalem to share their experiences and rediscover lost friendships. Now, I had visited concentration camps in Europe and had heard stories of the Holocaust before, and I thought I was beyond shocking by further tales of horror. But as I viewed these interviews, I found that I was not. One woman, for example, told of how she was incarcerated in Auschwitz and was forced, because she was a nurse, to become the gynecologist at Auschwitz. She noticed that Dr. Mengele who housed all of the pregnant women together in a certain barracks, and some time passed and she no longer saw any of these women. She made inquiries. What happened to the women who were housed in that barracks? Oh, haven't you heard? came the reply. Dr. Mengele used them for vivisection. A rabbi told the story of uh, a woman at the camp who had a small infant. Dr. Mengele wanted to conduct experiments to see how long an infant could survive without nourishment. And so he had this woman's breasts bound up so that she couldn't suckle her baby. And every day the baby lost weight, which was eagerly monitored by Dr. Mengele. Desperately, this poor woman tried to keep the baby alive by feeding it bits of bread soaked in coffee, but all to no avail. Every day the baby lost weight, and each day Dr. Mengele weighed the baby to check its decline. 
Then a nurse came secretly to this woman and said, I brought a morphine injection for you to kill your baby and you can get out of this place. I've arranged a way of escape for you, but you can't bring the baby with you. The woman protested, I can't kill my own child. She said, look, the baby is going to die anyway. At least save yourself. And so this mother felt compelled to take the life of her own infant. My heart was torn as I heard these stories. The rabbi at Auschwitz said that it was as though there existed a world in which all of the Ten Commandments were reversed. Thou shalt lie, thou shalt kill, thou shalt steal. Mankind has never seen such a hell. And yet, in a real sense, if God does not exist, then our world is Auschwitz. There is no ultimate right and wrong. All things are permitted, but no atheist, no agnostic can live consistently and happily within the framework of such a worldview. Finally, let's look at the problem of purpose in life. The only way that most people who deny purpose in life manage to live happily is either by making up some purpose for their life, which amounts to self-delusion, as we saw at Sark, or else by not carrying out their views to its logical conclusions. For example, take the problem of death. According to the psychologist Ernst Bloch, the only way modern man lives in the face of death is by subconsciously borrowing the belief in immortality which his forefathers held to, even though he himself has no basis for this belief, since he does not believe in God. Bloch concludes, thus this quite shallow courage feasts on a borrowed credit card. It lives from earlier hopes and the support they had once provided. But modern man no longer has any right to that support, since he rejects God. But in order to live purposefully in the face of death, he makes a leap of faith to affirm a reason for living. We often find the same inconsistency among those who say that man and the universe came to exist for no purpose, or just by chance. For example, feminists have raised a storm of protest uh, over Freudian sexual psychology because they say it's chauvinistic and degrading to women. And some psychologists knuckled under and revised their theories. Now, this is totally inconsistent. If Freudian psychology is really true, then it doesn't matter if it's degrading to women. You can't change the truth because you don't like what it leads to. But people cannot live consistently and happily in a world in which other people are devalued. But if God does not exist, then nobody has any value. Only if God exists can one consistently support women's rights. For if God does not exist, then natural selection dictates that the male of the species is the dominant and aggressive one. Women would have no more rights than a female goat or a chicken has rights. In nature, whatever is, is right. But who can live with such a view? Apparently not even Freudian psychologists who revise their theories when pushed to their logical conclusions. Or take the sociological behaviorism of a man like B.F. Skinner. This view leads to the sort of society envisioned by George Orwell in 1984, where the government controls and programs the thought of everyone. If Pavlov's dog can be made to salivate when a bell rings, then so can a human being. And if Skinner's theories are right, there can be no moral objection to treating people like the rats in Skinner's wreck box as they run through their mazes, coaxed on by food and electric shocks. According to Skinner, all of our actions are programmed anyway. And if God does not exist, then no moral objection can be raised against this kind of program, for man is not qualitatively different from a rat. The result of matter plus time plus chance. But again, who can live with such a dehumanizing worldview? Or finally, take the biological determinism of a man like Francis Crick. The logical conclusion is that Man is like any other laboratory specimen. 
The world was horrified when it learned that in camps like Dachau, the Nazis had used prisoners for medical experiments on human beings. But why not? If God does not exist, there can be no objection to using people as human guinea pigs. A memorial at Dachau says, leaving them, never again. But this sort of thing continued to go on. It was recently revealed that in the United States, after the war, various persons of minority group uh, status were injected, unknown to them, with a sterilization drug by medical researchers. Mustn't we protest that this is wrong? That people are more than just electrochemical machines? The end of this view is population control, in which the weak and the unwanted are killed off to make room for the strong. But the only way we can consistently protest this view is if God exists. Only if God exists can there be purpose in life. And thus, as one modern writer has said, if God is dead, man is dead too. Man cannot live consistently and happily as though life were without meaning, value, and purpose. The finite world alone is insufficient to maintain a happy and consistent life. But that throws us on to the third and final alternative. And this is to challenge the worldview of modern man. To maintain that God does exist and that life does have meaning, value, and purpose. This is the position of biblical Christianity. Biblical Christianity thus provides the solution to the predicament of modern man. For according to the Christian worldview, God does exist and life does not end at the grave. Biblical Christianity provides the two necessary prerequisites for a happy and consistent life, God and immortality. According to the Christian worldview, life does have meaning because mankind is made in the personal image of God. And our destiny is to know God and enjoy him and his love forever. Life has value because God's own holy and righteous nature is the absolute standard of right and wrong, good and evil. And that nature is expressed toward us in the form of his divine commandments, which constitute for us our moral duties. And thus the moral choices we make now in this life are filled with an eternal significance. Finally, life has purpose. As the Westminster Catechism says, the end of man is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. And thus biblical Christianity succeeds precisely where atheism breaks down. The cosmic orphan can come home. Now, I want to make it clear that none of this tonight proves that biblical Christianity is true, but I think that it does clearly spell out the alternatives before us. God exists, then life is futile. If the God of the Bible does exist, then life is meaningful. Only the second of these two alternatives enables us to live a happy and consistent life. And therefore, it seems to me that even if the evidence formed against these two alternatives were absolutely equal, that the rational thing to do is to believe in God. That is to say, it seems to me that if the evidence is equal, that it is positively irrational to prefer death, futility, and destruction to life, meaningfulness, and happiness. As Pascal has written, we have nothing to lose and infinity to gain. Well, now at this time, we're going to throw it open for your questions and discussion. And Ethan is going to assist us, I think, with doing that. All right. So if you want to, if you're interested in listening to the Q&A period after that, then, you know, it's pretty easy to find on on YouTube or wherever else uh, if you want to again if you're interested in hearing the audience from that university ask questions and so on and so forth um, but first I pull up this outline here 
do you think first off do you think craig dr craig there do you feel like that he do you feel like that he at least does a good job of rattling the cage as to why that question may be important <clears throat> now remember even if you can't hear the student responses that's okay because you can ask yourself these questions right as i'm tossing these out Right. He, he seems to at least uh, try to draw out the implications as to why this shouldn't just be something like, well, it doesn't matter to me. I don't care. This right. Last, this last point. Does that make sense? Now, do you think that he's right in that? that that's the bigger question, right? That's the bigger question about, you know, his uh, presentation is do you feel like that he's correct in that or do you feel like that he's wrong? in that what do you think because what does he essentially spell out for uh the question of not of god's non-existence what does he essentially spell out as the the uh, the alternative that there is no god nihilism or nihilism right he's saying that if god is not what is nihilism Well, not apathy, but there's pointlessness, right? There's purposelessness, there's meaninglessness. And nihilism, how did nihilism come about? Essentially after the Enlightenment, right? After the philosophical period of the Enlightenment, a lot of atheistic philosophers, what Craig is saying here, and what, I mean, just really did happen, was a lot of atheistic philosophers believe that the logical implications of you being the same as every other living being, that there just really is no what? Purpose or meaning point, right? So that wasn't necessarily Craig's uh, belief, though I think obviously it is, but he's trying to say what? Look, this is just, this is their own view, right? This is what Craig's saying of Bertrand Russell, of Eugene Paul Sartre, Albert Camus, uh, you know, these other guys is, is is that right like so for instance you've got a popular a popularist type atheist now like richard dawkins who again i don't know why on earth your book recommends to read richard dawkins if you're going to be an atheist because i'm just going to be brutally uh honest here and and blunt and and something of you know kind of uncharitable but that's not who you need to read for atheistic arguments. I mean, they're a joke. Don't read those. I had, I remember I had to read the God delusion in grad school and even in undergrad. Uh, he's, he's an intelligent guy, but he's just not a flight. He just doesn't have any good arguments. So again, I'm going to go through our arguments against non God's non existence. I'm going to say, tell you to read somebody like Anthony flew or, uh, AJ Ayer or, or maybe even kind Nelson, some of these philosophers that have like, you know, good arguments that you have to deal with good arguments, not just poppycock and freaking internet crap. Right. So for instance, you know how Richard Dawkins answers that argument right there. Craig says there is no purpose to life, but I plan on having a purpose, a purposeful lunch this afternoon, lunch this afternoon. I watched a, a, a forum where that went back. And of course the audience, what? Because they were Dawkins fans, they died laughing, right? But what's the problem? Am I missing something here? <laughs> You're going to answer that with you purpose. There is no purpose to life, but you purpose to have a good lunch. Tough. <laughs> That's it. Well, That's. I think the argument there is, is pointing out that law well, might not be objective to accomplish the purpose of the Right, which is just what? Which is what? Craig's point is just what? That that's what? delusional right so for instance if dawkins says that you can believe god exists you can pick that for your life and believe that but the end of the day you're that's what a delusion that's what delusional you can believe that if you want to whatever well the sword is double-edged right well if you want to believe that having a good lunch this afternoon or whatever else your career is purposeful 
in light of the truth about reality, that's just what? Delusional. That's Craig's point. You can't answer an argument in a 15 second sound bite. This is what modern politics and Facebook and all this stuff has done to the intellectual environment of, of your generation and even a lot of mine, the younger generation of mine, right? We don't even know how to engage arguments. We think a 15 second sound bite will solve it. That's just BS, freaking ridiculous. So the question about Quig, uh, about Quig, Malwedge, who's seen that movie? Princess Bride. Who likes Princess Bride? I haven't seen Princess Bride, Brian. There is no God then. <laughs> if you haven't seen Princess Bride and or you think it's not good, God does not exist. <laughs> um, but anyway, Craig's point is the part that we have to wrestle with here, and this is where your uh, book, you can read this in your book here, because he offers some, uh, Stephen Hales in your book here, offers some of the criticisms, skills wager, but they would also be applicable here to Craig's argument. Essentially, because again, what does Craig's argument assume? It assumes that the nihilistic philosophers, the atheistic philosophers, that there is just purposelessness if there is no God is the right position, right? That's what Craig's argument, well, not argument, but Craig's point is trying to be, right? That's what he's trying to get across. Now, here in your book, page 88 to 94, uh, you're going to see Stephen Hales argue. He's talking about Pascal's wager specifically, but a lot of the same things can be applied to what Craig's saying here. So what you have to do is you have Remember, it's not necessarily important that we're using the same textbook um, at this point. Don't worry about that if we're not using the same text. See if that's what? You have to see if those points are what? Or plausible, right? You have to see if those are compelling points, right? Or you have to see if what Craig is saying is more compelling, right? Something like that. So, Hales will offer, we've got just a couple of minutes, I'll, I'll flip to that real quick. Page 80, what did I say, 88 to 94? 88 to 94. If you have your book, you can turn to that there. So some of these <clears throat> obviously don't necessarily apply. So Pascal's wager is obviously a wager, which means well, like a bet in some sense. So some of his objections are about, you know, the odds against betting and not betting, something like that. But then I think that if I'm not mistaken, you know, when I had when I read this text earlier, uh, basically I think he also tries to at least talk about the value of your life, which is the big one. I think objection four on page 92. Yeah. Objection four on page 92, Stephen Hills tried, tries to uh, answer this <clears throat> whole thing about the value of your life. So, for instance, he says, Premise five and six assume that there is no God and then follow out the consequences of belief and disbelief in God. According to Pascal, if there is no God, then it doesn't matter what you believe. You gain nothing by being right and lose nothing by being wrong. What makes this hard to believe is that genuine belief affects your actions. So if you go ahead and, 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 and read that, He's going to try to answer that whole thing about, well, maybe, you know, there is value just because there's no such thing as God. Well, you know, look, does it really follow? There's no value or pointlessness. Uh, is that really the end game? Is that really the end result? So Hales tries to answer that. Now, what again, what you have to do uh, is you'll have to see if that's plausible in light of what Craig is saying. And then, of course, you can also read the rest of just some of the stuff to Pascal's wager, wager in general. Um, now, one of the other implications, because Craig is painting with a broad brush here about nihilism, right? He also says that there are no ultimate moral values and duties, right? Now, when we talk about ethics, we'll get to that. We'll see if, uh, if any of the ethical theories that we talk about, utilitarian, because these ethical theories are going to try to say that there are what? That there are what? Rights and wrongs, Right. That's utilitarianism is going to try to do that, whether there's a God or not, right? These two utilitarianism points. is an ethical theory that's going to try to say what? Look, we don't need God to have what? Rights and wrongs, right? So 
that's utilitarianism. We're going to have another system that tries to do that. Deontology, right? A deontological or Kant specifically Kant's down because there's a lot of different ethical theories that follow un, follow under deontology, but Kant's specifically deontological or deontological ethic is going to try to say that there are rights and wrongs without what? Without God, right? And then we're going to talk about some of the others that say, no, you have to have God in order to have these rights and wrongs. So you have to kind of keep all of those things in mind as you think about what Craig is saying here. Um, and then also what we're going to do when we talk about this, especially getting into ethics, the reason we're doing this God question first before we talk about ethics is because we're interested in the metaphysical grounding, what are called meta ethics, what grounds these objective or supposedly allegedly objective moral rights and wrongs with or without God. What is the grounding for that? Right? So Craig has already tried to undermine that in one way. How, how did he try to undermine that when he's, when he talks about there's no real right or wrong, if there is no God. Right here. What's one way he tried to undermine that right before we leave here? Basically, he just says what? You're, you are just what? Mind what? Well, not mind. You're what? Matter plus time plus chance, right? Like, you know, intrinsically, you're no different than what? This desk right here, right? You're just a different conglomeration of atoms, right? So if this desk bumps into that desk, does it do anything wrong? No, it just bumps into it, right? And so if you, just a conglomeration of atoms, you know, just like sharks, most sharks forcibly copulate, you know, the word, the layman's term is rape there, or like Lacey was saying the other day, orangutans and chimpanzees and ape species rape one another regularly to propagate their species. You're just an intelligent ape as well. Now, people may not like that, that you do that, but hey, who says it's wrong? Your grandma? Sorry. I'm just an evolved animal. You're just an evolved animal. So that's what he's trying to go after there, right? When he says that there are no ultimate right or wrongs there, he's just trying to say, look, on that view, that's all you are. There is nothing else about you except your intelligence. Whoopity friggin' do. Right? So you're a more intelligent ape than that one. Great. Fantastic. So that's how he's trying to undermine that, right? Again, what you're going to have to do is you're going to try to think, you've got to think about all of those types of questions as you evaluate what he's saying. Well, is that right? Is that, I'm not talking about morally here, is, is what he's saying correct or incorrect? Does that follow? Do you think that follows? And then read some of this stuff that you think Hales uh, says here. So as we end to, to, to get out of here today, basically we watch that again because we're just trying to shake up the cage in the sense of does it matter whether or not God exists, right? Does it matter? Is it a big question or not? Hopefully, look, if, if what Craig is saying is true, then hopefully he's done what he wants to do, which is to say that it matters, right? You have to evaluate that. All right. Uh, again, just go ahead and read over some of these God arguments in your book because you're going to get some of the objections to those in there. Right, so when we start this officially Monday, when we go through our first argument for God's existence, you're already going to see the objections to that uh, argument. So you can bring those up in class as I go through the argument. You can say, well, wait about what about this? What about this? So you'll already be familiar with some of the objections, and we'll see if those hold or if they don't hold. All right, have a good weekend. All right, so obviously there's your first lecture on apathy right hopefully again craig is trying to rattle existential cage to get you to think about this right this is a massive um topic that really should be addressed now what we're going to talk about next is the uh that was our apathy does god exist apathy right um the next lecture is going to go straight into this view from a thousand feet above right are what are these arguments for the existence of god um kind of a, a grand overview of the arguments for and against kind of thing. Um, see you next time, guys. Adios.